Welcome to St. Martin in the Fields and welcome to Great Sacred Music. Today, uh, just as our Lent course is talking about George Herbert, we've chosen some George Herbert words and music for you for Great Sacred Music. So I forgot to say a special welcome to those joining us online. Born in Wales in 1593 into the aristocratic Pembroke family, George Herbert became public orator at Cambridge University and then a member of parliament, apparently destined for a life at court. To much surprise, he decided to be ordained and after spending a period with his friend Nicholas Ferrer at Little Gidding, he became incumbent of the parish of Bemerton near Salisbury. Now the hard-hearted amongst Anglican clergy of the 21st century think that George Herbert did more harm than good. Why? Because he created this ideal of a parish ministry where you wrote poems, served the poor, led worship, and were remembered forevermore for being the perfect parish priest. In fact, there were never more than 100 people in his church, and he died after only three years in the parish. He wrote prolifically, his hymns still being popular throughout the English-speaking world, and his treatise on the priestly life, the country parson, and his poetry, especially the temple, earned him a leading place in English literature. He was only 40 when he died in 1633. But the most important thing you need to know about George Herbert was that he worshipped at St. Martin in the Fields when he lived in London. He lived just around the corner behind the church here, and it was not this St. Martin in the Fields, of course, it was the previous building that was here before this building was built in 1726. So he has a claim to fame at St. Martin in the Fields, and that is as good as it gets. We're going to start, as we always do, by singing together. We're going to sing on the inside of the sheets, the hymn that you'll find on the left-hand side, which comes from Herbert's poem, The Elixir, about finding the divine in the everyday. You might recall the word philosopher's stone, which was not invented by J.K. Rowling, but actually refers to the ancient practice of alchemy, which sought to turn base metal uh, into gold. Perhaps the best definition of prayer, certainly that I know, is with verse two of this hymn, a man that looks on glass on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth through it pass, and then, then the heaven espy. The whole theology of icons is contained in those four lines. The West Country tune that we're going to sing, Sandy's, was first published in William Sandy's Christmas Carols in 1833. So this poem was written 200 years before the tune to which it's usually set. We remain seated. The voices stand and lead us as we sing, Teach Me my God and King.
George Herbert's poem, Easter, was written in 1633. It was originally two separate poems, and in the version we're going to hear now, Rise, Heart, Thy Lord is Risen, uh, Cecilia McDowell, who is a great friend of St. Martin Fields, in fact, has presented her own music from this very lectern at Great Sacred Music in the past. Uh, she takes just the first part of the original 1633 poem. It's a poem, of course, about Easter. The title rather gives it away. Uh, and what she portrays is Christ stretched out in death on the wood of the cross, becoming God's instrument, almost like a violin string, playing a melody of love to the world. The heart responds to the melody by joining with it, as instrumentalists join together in consort to make music. But since none can sing this tune perfectly, a further strand needs to be woven, that of the spirit who makes up our defects with his sweet art. So it's a whole Trinitarian theology of the cross and of our response to the cross and uh, Christ's resurrection, a remarkable poem in just a few short lines. Let's enjoy Cecilia McDowell's version of it now. <laughs>
Herbert, rather like John Donne, is a classic in terms of reflecting on his worldly ambitions and then how those were transitioned to his priestly vocation. He said, I can now behold the king's court with an impartial eye and see plainly that it is made up of fraud, titles, and flattery. Are you listening, King Charles? And many other such empty imaginary and painted pleasures, pleasures that are so empty as not to satisfy when they are enjoyed. So any courtiers with us today? Sorry, that's the deal. None of George Herbert's poems were published in his lifetime, but he bequeathed his poems to his friend Nicholas Ferrer, and within 40 years they'd gone through 13 editions, a total of more than 20,000 copies, which was a startling publication run in the mid-17th century, if you reflect that most of the population were not literate. We're going to hear um, now uh, Bob Chilcott's setting of Even Song. I, I don't kn know if... Uh, George Herbert was familiar with the tradition of Ignatius Loyola and the uh, Jesuits and the tradition of the ex XMN that started about a hundred years before he was writing his poems, but in many ways this poem is a bit like an XMN, and those of you familiar with the genre will know that that involves the practice in the evening of reflecting on the day and reflecting and cherishing those moments that brought joy and gladness and reflecting those other moments that took you in a different direction. Well, in this poem, Herbert asks himself what he's brought home at the end of the day in response to God's love. He describes himself as having run, but only to no obvious purpose other than to be like wind or a bubble or foam. But God says it is enough. He asks which shows more love God greeting us in the new day or taking us as we are at the end of it. Then he recognizes that the whole day is filled with God's love and with that he falls asleep in his bed. Then we're going to hear perhaps uh, George Herbert's most famous poem, Love Bade Me Welcome, in a contemporary setting by Judith Weir. The scene is a banquet to which the poet is invited. He holds back, afraid of going in. Love continues to invite, asking the poet's reason for withdrawing. The poet says he's not worthy. Love insists the poet is worthy. The poet continues to doubt. Love takes the poet's hand and reels off terms of endearment. The poet continues to draw back. Love continues to turn the tables on the poet. The poet, like the prodigal son, says, I will come and serve. But love says, no, I will serve you. And the poet finally gives in. Let's enjoy these two contemporary settings now.
Well, we've already spoken about uh, Herbert's collection, The Temple, that was published after his death and went to so many editions. The God of Love My Shepherd is, based on Psalm 23, is the only psalm in that whole connect collection, which is curious given how much before the days of Isaac Watts in the early 18th century, hymns were dominated by the singing of the psalms. The 23rd Psalm, as I'm sure many of you know, speaks of kindness, goodness, care, and mercy, but it doesn't actually mention the word love. It was Herbert that introduced the word love into the 23rd Psalm, and we can't imagine the 23rd Psalm without it, even though David or whoever wrote the 23rd Psalm didn't include the word himself. And when, when Sir Henry Williams Baker wrote The King of Love My Shepherd Is to include it in the first edition of Hymns Ancient and Modern, in 1861 he followed suit. Herbert's emphasis is on the relationship between the believer and God, memorably in the words, he is mine and I am his. And if you find those on the inside of the sheets, you can find that those words come in the third and fourth line of the first verse. And those of you who are thinking of what you might write on your tombstone. I'm sure I can see people thinking about that even as we speak. Um, well, as a humble suggestion, you couldn't do much better than this. While he is mine and I am his, what else can I want or need? Let's enjoy singing this together. We remain seated and the voices stand and lead us. Well, we're coming towards the end of Great Sacred Music for this week. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. If you have, there's an opportunity to make a swipe or a cash donation as you leave. And those joining us uh, online can text in or can go on the website and make a donation too, for which we'd be very grateful. Next, uh, this coming Sunday, we have our sister program, Choral Classics, where we are finishing our fourfold series on Lord of All Hopefulness, this time Lord of All Calm. And 
at the next Great Sacred Music, we will be looking at St. David. Now, uh, I should also say that we've got a special treat this Sunday at 10 o'clock at our uh, worship service, our parish Eucharist, because we have Steve Chalk, who's the leading Christian social entrepreneur in the country, coming to talk about his vision for schools and his vision for a new politics. Not that anyone's suggesting we need a new politics, you understand. We're perfectly happy with the current one. But it's nice to hear that people have got ideas of where we should be going as a country. We're going to finish with a succinct description of George Herbert's understanding of both authority and holiness, let all the world. When Herbert, on his deathbed at age 39, gave the temple to Nicholas Ferrer, he gave it this inscription, tell him he shall find in it a picture of the many spiritual conflicts that have passed betwixt God and my soul before I could subject mine to the will of Jesus my master, in whose service I have now found perfect freedom. Desire him to read it, and then, if he can think it may turn to the advantage of any dejected poor soul, let it be made public. If not, let him burn it, for I and it are less than the least of God's mercies. Well, I think we're all pretty happy that he didn't burn it. And certainly Bob Chilcott and Judith Weir and Cecilia McDowell have made a living out of it, so they're probably pretty glad too. In this, originally a poem, then a hymn, and now an, an anthem, Herbert explores four contexts in which God may be praised. He begins with heaven, the throne of grace. He then turns to earth, the scene of Christ's incarnation. He proceeds to the church where God's name is recognized and celebrated, and he concludes with the human heart, the seat of sincerity and truth. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.